We are now joined live by former South Africa and current Namibia all-rounder David Visa to discuss life as a freelance cricketer around the world. A brilliant concept, I have to say. A uh, magnificent hitman for hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer. We've been speaking about uh, franchise cricketers, well, probably for about 20 years since uh, the first West Indians became freelance and refused national contracts. But David's in a, a slightly different uh, situation, a different position. Um, in the, um, <laughs> I was about to use the red wine an analogy, in the twilight of your career, it seemed to be getting better and better. <laughs> But David, what what seriously actually mean it? I know it's a cliche, but but what prompted you to to do this series? I mean, it's it, it's fascinating. I, Harmy and I have only heard a couple of clips. You can't wait to get get really stuck into it. But what motivated it? Yeah, first of all, hi guys, and thanks for having me on your show. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was actually just an idea that that we had uh, myself and Sam Kerr, who who does the podcast with me. Um, you know, I think everybody is talking about franchise cricket at this stage. It's, it is all over the place. There's, there's such a big bubble at this stage. There's so many tournaments. But I don't think people actually know what goes on behind the scene. They see the glitz and the glamour. They see all the tournaments and, you know, the big cash bonuses, everything. But they don't actually know what goes on behind the scenes and, and how it actually affects the players, affects the families, everything. You know, we just came up with this concept. Um, you know, last year... I was fortunate to play in you know pretty much almost every single tournament that was there, and it just kind of fell in place perfectly for us just to you know almost document a year in the life of of what a franchise cricketer goes through. And um, have you spoken to to the to the hard truth, David? Because um, I, 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 what prompts me to say that is Adil Rashid, to my mind, is the only franchise cricketer who has admitted that that it is difficult practically and emotionally moving from team to team to team um you know and he he admitted that uh, there were days when he had to try and think who the coach was and and it's very well to sort of clasp the badge on your shirt and say you know i'm gonna uh run through a brick wall for this team but you have to remember which team you're playing in at that moment yeah that, that does get challenging um you know every single month you're playing for a different team you're playing for different coach and different players and you know, you've got to almost keep it in perspective in, in what it's, you know, what it's there. And, and, you know, for me, it's just a playing franchise cricket is it's a fantastic opportunity just to showcase your skills. Um, you know, it's, it's, you get to go and travel all the places in the world that, you know, me personally, I would never have gone to if, if it wasn't for cricket. And, you know, and financially, obviously, there's always that incentive also. And, you know, it is tough on the families. It is tough on the players. And, you know, you essentially only one bad tournament away from being retired. Um, and, and that does put a lot of stress on you. But, you know, it's what we've signed up for and we're fortunate enough to be able to do what we love. And David, you got, you know, obviously the, the franchise cricket now is, is obviously 12 months. Just run us through what a, a franchise cricket calendar looks like. So somebody like yourself, you know, they're going around the world and place to place. What does it actually you know, feel like and look like for, for you as an individual? So, you know, for the first time now, you can actually start picking and choosing because there's so many tournaments and they're overlapping. You almost, you know, you have so much opportunities out there that you, know, you, you almost got to think, you know, what's best for you as a player. It's all well and good trying to go play every single tournament. But, you know, there is mental fatigue there. You know, you know physically you get tired. And, you know, especially if you have a family at home, it's, it's difficult to be away the whole time. So, you know, I mean, if I have to just think of myself last year, I went... I left for Dubai for the ILT20 on the 4th of January. I went straight from there to Pakistan. Then I was home for four days, straight from there. Then there I went to the IPL, straight to the UK for the Blast, straight to America for the Major League, straight back to the UK for you know, the 100. And then I only eventually got home on about the 25th or the 26th of August. So I spent about six days at home um, you know, for the first eight months of the year. And it, and that was an exceptional circumstance. You know, you, you don't have to play all of those tournaments, but I just saw that as a great opportunity for me to learn as a player and, you know, just to go out, you know, like Neil said, I'm in the twilight now, so there's not a lot of opportunities that's going to come my way anymore. So, you know, I just took that on as a challenge. But, you know, it does get tough after, you know, about the third or fourth tournament, you start thinking and questioning, you know, maybe you're sacrificing too much, maybe you're being away from your family too much. You know, there are always those things in the back of your mind. And there's quite a few things in that. You know, me and Manners have spoke about, you know, over the last couple of years about 
you know, uh, with likes Alex Stewart talking about from a club's point of view and how they look after the franchise cricketers. Is this a, a little bit like a golfer? And are we going down the sort of golfer's route, which is the pick and choose tournaments where they play around the world and potentially have their own teams as individuals, i.e. you have your own fitness coach, you have your own batting coach, your own bowling coach. As, a, as an individual, so you, you come less as a team member rather than it, an individual sort of commodity going into this because it just seems as though, you know, like Man has mentioned before, you know, you've got this team, you've got that team, you've got another team, but you as an individual have got to be the best version of yourself to make sure that you are pre- prepared right for these teams. Are we going down that yeah. route from like, like a golfer's type? I think it could be. I mean, there are a couple of the guys that actually travel with their own you know, you, you want to call it a performance director or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, just someone who, who they've worked with as a as a S and C, as a strength and conditioning coach, as a physio, you know, they'll they'll bring them on. And I think also that became quite prevalent in the COVID times where you had to be in a bubble the whole time. You know, you, you actually just bring somebody along that that you get on with, that you can spend time with. Um and that just makes touring a little bit easier. But you know, like you said, it's it's getting to that stage where, you know, you as an individual become such an important commodity that, you know, if you don't look after yourself, because that's the one challenging thing that I found as a franchise cricketer is that you don't have a home base. So when you're not playing, you kind of have to look after yourself. You have to get your own physios. You have to organize your own training. You Sometimes you have to pay for facilities. You have to, you know, ask old clubs if you can use their nets and get somebody to throw balls at you. So that is the challenging side of it. And I think it's it's going to move towards that where, you know, you'll find guys traveling with their own coaches or their own performance managers um, you know, just to make sure they're getting the best out of themselves. David, I've obviously got experience of touring, having done it for over 30 years, and I've just spent two months on the road now. And obviously, um, I don't get uh, offered the big bucks doing my job. But if somebody said to me, <laughs> um, w- would, you, uh, would you go on the road for eight months? I, I, would, I honestly uh, would have to say no. Um, I mean, you, you've touched on it there. But the, the support that you need from a mental health perspective must be enormous. I, I mean, I, one bit I did hear as well is you throw in the security in the PSL, for example, and that's yet another kind of weight on your mind. You said there's like five or 6,000 people involved in the security operation just for a practice session. Yeah, it, it is insane. I mean, the, the PSL is, is a is a own beast, you know, you until you actually go play there, you, you don't actually understand the intricacies of, of what actually goes on there. But it's a tournament that I love playing. I, I think it's a fantastic tournament. And, you know, I've, I've said that the Calandas is the one team that's actually, you know, almost sparked my career again because, you know, they gave me the opportunity to go play there. But, um, yeah, you're, you're right there. I mean, it is a daunting challenge to, to take on, like you say, you know, eight months at a time. And, you know, it didn't actually, for me, start out that way. Um, you know, it just sort of compounded. I, I started off in Dubai and then the PSL. I wasn't expecting to get an IPL contract and that came along. So that usually took away, you know, two months where I would be at home. Then the blast came along, which I'd signed for already because I enjoyed my time in Leeds. Um, the major league wasn't something that I was bargaining on, but then that came along as a new tournament. So we're like, okay, let's give it a go. And then the 100 got signed there. So, yeah, it's, it's nothing that you you almost set out to do, but it just compounded on me. And, and at the end, you know, you never want to be in that situation where you're not able to give your best. But I, I did feel towards the end, you know, every time you go step across the bounds onto the field, you're always giving your 100%. But, you know, there are times when you get to training sessions where, where you just start you know, lacking a bit of motivation towards the end. And that's when you know, okay, you know, maybe it's time that you need to step back now and just, you know, take a bit of time for yourself. And David, do you think... Franchise cricketers and you know franchise cricket itself gets a bad name because of what you know the traditional you know older you know cricket loving followers with red ball cricket and test match cricket. Do you think you know the franchise gets a bad name because of that? I think there are the the purists in the game that's going to go and you know always push push against franchise cricket. Um, you know, for me myself, I. I think they can both coincide. You know, I think international cricket and franchise cricket can coincide. Um, it, it's up to the players at the end of the day. You know, I've always said that you know, international cricket, playing for your country, should always be your number one. And the franchise cricket is almost a reward for your performances that you've done internationally. 
Um, you know, franchise cricket is such a fickle world that if you just go put all your eggs in one basket, you know, you have one, like I said, you have one or two bad tournaments and then, you know, your career is almost over. So, you know, I, I always like to think that, you know, you, you've always got to focus mainly on your international career, on playing for your country. And then maybe towards the back end or, you know, when you start reevaluating things a little bit. And, and once you've actually learned your game and now you just want to focus on specific skills, then you can maybe become more of a mercenary. But, you know, for me, I almost get a little bit sad when I see the younger guys, the 21, 22 year olds who are already you know, leaving the red ball cricket just to go focus on, on white ball. I think, you know, you're missing out on a big chunk of learning and you know, a massive part of your career if you're doing that. David, I'm famous for asking two questions in one because I, I'm, I hate running out of time. But so I want to ask you about Namibia's games against England, Australia. You, you got you got the big two. You're not playing India, but you've got England and Australia in the T20 World Cup. So your thoughts on that. But what I really want to know is after eight months on the road, what are the three things top of your priority list? I don't know whether you have dogs. They probably don't remember you. Um, but like walking the dogs or going to the beach or what? what is it? Um, so I've, I've got quite a young family at home. Uh, my daughters are four and two. So fortunately, you know, they could come out and, and they came quite a bit on tour with me. Uh, you know, school's not such a, a big thing at, at that age, I suppose. And it's not like in the UK where you get actually fined if you take them out of the schools. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate that, that they could come with, with me, you know, for quite a few of the tours. But, you know, for me, as soon as I got home, it's just the small things for me, like taking my daughter to school every single day, you know, being able to drop her off every single day at school, taking her to her dance classes, their swimming lessons. You know, it's just those small things like that. Um, the dogs do bark at me when I get home. They've got no clue who I am anymore. <laughs> um, but, but that's okay. At least it shows me that they're doing the job then. They're, they're still securing the place. Um, but for me, it's, it's just when I'm away for so much, it's just trying to spend as much time with, with my family as possible. Um, you know, that's, why this is why I'm doing it is for the family and, and for their future. And, um, you know, for me just to be home for six, seven weeks at a time and just try and spend as much time as possible with them there. And then on your second half of the question about us facing Australia and England, that is a bit of a tough one. I'm not going to lie. Um, it was almost like they said to you, said to us, okay, we're going to chuck you in the group with Australia and England, but we're going to base you in Barbados and Antigua. So, you know, it'll be okay. Um, at least we'll have a good time there. <laughs> um, but hey, stranger things have happened. I mean, we we took down at that stage the Asia Cup champions in Sri Lanka in the last World Cup. Um, you know, it, it's going to be tough for this time. But England have a bit of a reputation of losing to to minor teams in a World Cup. I mean, Ireland's done it to them if, before. Um, Netherlands have also. So you never know. Um, we could go there. And, Everything could be in our favor. Conditions could just work out perfectly, and we could cause a shock. Um, but it's, it's going to be tough for us. It's, it's, it's going to be one of those massive learning curve tournaments. And I think it's also going to put things in perspective for a lot of the Namibian guys, like what it is like to play at that top level and to, to play against the best in the world. And what's on the horizon leading into that, David? What's the preparation for yourself individually and for Namibia to get to that point where you go to Barbados and Antigua and take on the, the world, uh, world T20? So the one tough thing for Namibia is that we don't always get the, the opportunities that we'd like to to actually prep for tournaments. Um, fortunately, this this time around, we, we're we going to Oman at the end of this month now to play five T20s mm. there against Oman. Um, and that takes us to middle April, and then we'll have a month of just prepping at home before we leave for the World Cup. Uh, me, personally, I'm signed up here to play again for the Titans, a team that I played for you know locally for 10 years before I signed Colpac. Um, you know, I'm just going to play a bit of the CSA T20 local cup over here just to stay with it, you know, just to keep with game time. I find um, for me, especially with the older bones now, if I stop for too long, then it kind of hurts a bit too much when I when I start up again. So, so it's good to, to just keep on ticking over the whole time. So yeah, I'll just be getting as much game time as I possibly can uh, leading into that World Cup. David Visa, thanks so much for your time. Thanks you for joining us. Congratulations on the podcast. Hopefully it was a little bit of therapy um, in between all the practicing and the training. Hitman for hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer. Enjoy the few days off that you've got. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys.
on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.